What was the first mineral in the cosmos? It's astonishing to me. No one had ever asked that question before. It's just, it's just beyond belief that in centuries of thinking about minerals, no one had ever said, what well, was the first crystal in the cosmos that had a well-defined chemical composition? And think about it. What was the first mineral in the cosmos? Let's think ourselves back to the Big Bang. At the Big Bang, there were no elements, so no minerals. It's much too hot. And then after a few hundred thousand years, you form the first atoms of hydrogen and helium, maybe a little bit of lithium, but hydrogen and helium don't form crystals, at least not at the kinds of conditions that were present then. No minerals. So you had to form the first stars. And there are no minerals in the first stars because it was plasma, it's much too hot again. So when do you have temperatures cool enough to form a crystal, but the concentration of mineral forming elements, not hydrogen and helium, high enough that you get the atoms interacting to form a crystal? The answer turns out to be diamond. It's diamond because carbon is a very abundant element in stars that forms one of the outer elements. As a star explodes, the star has regions that are carbon rich. And diamond is the highest temperature condensing crystal. It forms at about 4,000 Celsius. And you had to cool down another 400 degrees for the second mineral, that was graphite, and then cool down a little bit more for the third mineral, which was moissanite, which is silicon carbide. And here we see the first three minerals in the cosmos are carbon minerals. And this carbon mineral is partly because of the high temperature formation and partly because of the abundance of those elements. And then all the other ur minerals, the dozen or so minerals that occur and are still preserved in pre-solar grains, they form in these exploding stars in the envelopes of supernovas and other types of energetic stars, AGB type stars, if you're interested. And the envelopes of fusion as you go farther and farther out. There's that carbon-rich zone, oxygen and carbon, nitrogen and so forth. So you get these dozen or so minerals. They're still preserved in pre-solar grains. You can identify them by their extreme isotope anomalies. That's the starting point of mineral evolution. And perhaps uh, the fact that carbon is rich amongst them and the diamond is first, I just love that. But here's the basic question of mineral evolution. How do you go from a dozen to the greater than you know, almost 5,000 today, 4,700 or so. And what does this tell us about Earth history, about the origin and evolution of life? Turns out there's an incredible story hidden in the minerals. Let me take you through that story. Uh, by the way, just to give you a sense, we'll use carbon minerals as kind of a, a foundation. There are about 387 known carbon minerals, uh, carbon uh, forms of diamond, graphite primarily, then carbides, and pr most abundantly carbonates. These are minerals with CO3 groups, central carbon and a triangle of oxygen around them, and then a bunch of organic minerals that pop up fairly recently in Earth history. Let's look at these through history. By the way, the reason carbon is so fascinating and the reason we've written an entire book and that, that we should study this more is it is the most chemically diverse of all the elements. It's special, it's unique. You could argue it's the most important element in our lives too, but it has oxidation states from minus four to plus four. It bonds to almost 80 different elements in the periodic table. That's astonishing. Carbon actually literally bonds to all those other elements. And it occurs in two, three, and four coordination in various minerals. So it has these different flexibilities that allow it to do many, many different chemical things. Okay, imagine now you have clouds of dust and gas, the ones that were described yesterday so beautifully with all those organic molecules. And these clouds of dust and gas contain those dozen ur minerals. Some perturbation, perhaps a supernova explosion, causes a shockwave, and some volume of that cloud and dust and gas begins to collapse, begins to swirl, begins to come together. That's the solar nebula. And 99.9% .9 of the mass comes together in the central sun that's just beginning, our protostar. Well, all the rest of the debris, what would become the planets and the moons and all the other materials, that's that 0.1% that's on the outside. And at some point, pressure, temperature build. The star begins to go through transitions, magnetic transitions, which cause pulses of energy, what's called the T tauri phase of the early solar system, the solar nebula. These pulses of heat blast out. And those dust, the dust which has come together like little dust bunnies, they've electrostatically stuck together. So now you can imagine dust bunnies in space hit by blasts of thermal radiation. They melt, they condense down into tiny droplets called chondrules. And the first earliest materials of the solar system, you can hold these in your hand, the commonest meteorites, the chondral 
chondrite meteorites, which have these little droplets. Again, formed at high temperature, but not quite so high temperature. The ur minerals are all above 1,900 degrees or so. These are minerals that are above perhaps 11 or 1,200 degrees. And so we have 60 mineral species in all, and this is the earliest building blocks of the planets and moons. Now, these begin to clump together through gravity, larger and larger, a kilometer, 10, 50, 100. When you get to 100 kilometers, this object, because of the gravitational potential and the radioactive short-lived elements produce huge amounts of heat, start to melt these objects. They begin to differentiate metallic cores, silicate mantles. You have aqueous alteration, forming clay minerals and hydroxides. You have thermal alteration, causing new metamorphic materials. You have shock minerals, impacts when two objects come together at hypervelocities. And these lead to roughly 250 minerals, they're new carbonates, but about 250 minerals in all at this stage. These are the building blocks of all the planets and moons, these 250 mineral species. We've gone from 12 to 60, to 250 just by processing. And the idea of mineral evolution is that you do process elements through fluid rock interactions by new ranges of temperature pressure, ultimately through biology, as we'll see. A fascinating aspect of this is all of the chemical diversity that we see on Earth today was present. All the rare elements, cesium and uranium, tantalum and beryllium were present, but there are no minerals yet. Those elements are somewhere. When you hold a chondrite in your hand, all those elements are present. But they're so widely dispersed, you simply cannot find them. And so this is a mystery. Where is the beryllium? Where is the uranium when you hold that chondrite in your hand? It takes many years, billions of years probably of processing to get those minerals. Now, stage three, Earth is formed. We start beginning to have processes, internal heat causing volcanism, causing igneous processes, metamorphic processes, standard things that are known in a volatile rich body. This gets you up to about 420 different minerals, of which 30 are carbon minerals, graphite, diamond, uh, moissanite, the carbides, a bunch of carbonates, roughly um, 30 in all of the carbonate minerals. There's a complete list, which I've just had accepted for publication, of about 420 minerals if you're interested in knowing what minerals would be available to you for the origin of life, for example. That's where to find them, at least that's our preliminary list. And then, when you form a planet like Earth, in fact, all the planets, the terrestrial planets, the outer layer is a basalt, a black, iron, magnesium, silicate rock, which is very common on Mars. It's the mineral that you find on the surface of Venus and Mercury as well. Earth has enough internal heat, though, that you can partially melt that basalt veneer. And when you partially melt basalt, the liquid that results through 15 or 20 percent partial melting does not have the same composition. It's much more rich in silica, in alkalis, in aluminum. And so you form a mineral, a rock type called granite. Granite selects and concentrates many elements that were very rare before. It gets higher and higher concentrations of boron and beryllium and so forth. And so very quickly, you get up to a thousand minerals because you start forming various new minerals. Here are a couple of carbonates, a lithium carbonate, a beryllium carbonate, that would not have formed before granites and probably don't occur at all on Mars. This gets you up to a thousand species. And then plate tectonics. And if you want to talk about ways of reworking huge volumes of the crust and upper mantle, you take a tectonic plate, a slab of lithosphere, the crust and upper mantle. It plunges down hotter and hotter. It gets it partially melts, and the melt arise, and those fluids interact through literally millions of cubic kilometers of Earth's upper mantle and crust, selecting and concentrating elements, forming all sorts of new ore deposits, new kinds of volcanism, various sorts of mineral forming events, and so you get lots of new minerals. Here's a couple of carbonates that wouldn't have occurred before. 